difference, one cup at a time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time, time, time. making a difference, one cup at a time. Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is back, and we have an incredible guest in the house today. We have Mark Stephen Perrault here, all the way from France, south of France, and we're going to be talking tea, and we're going to be talking real tea this time. So for all of you listeners out there, we're going to be talking a theater, empathy, and availability, but we're also going to be serving a tea story because Mark wrote this incredible book, uh, Memoir, so we're going to be talking about elders care as well. So before we get that all started, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel, give that little bell a ring so you can watch these tea times at any time uh, in the morning, afternoon, evening, share it with a tea a family member or a friend that it might resonate with uh, because that's what all these tea times are about is sharing is caring and we spill the tea and we make a different kind of uh, awareness with tea. So let's get started with the disclaimer. Then I'm going to do some bio of Mark and then we're going to get Mark in here and we're going to share a good cup of tea with all of you guys out there. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section or send Miss Liz a direct message as you know how that works and Miss Liz will get it out there to Mark as we're having our conversation. Conversation. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Ms. Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, you should should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show, show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea time shows are done on Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, unless it's a special surprise or rescheduled tea time, then it's done Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So now a little bit about my guests. Well, Mark Stephen Pearl, a New Jersey native, Exit 163 earned an international industrial design degree from the Ohio State University. After years of agency work, his love of acting led him to Hollywood, where he appeared in dozens of television, films, and stage productions. Mark also spends his 28 years in Tinseltown entertain, entrepreneuring. He started his five nonprofit companies, but holds the applause now were intended to be he now lives in south of france but hold hold your pity he's on the sound mind and body chose choose to suffer in the heart of wine country where the locals insist his french isn't so bad at least that's what he thinks they're saying uh, mark is an award-winning designer writer director and now a best-selling award-winning author he has written lots of jokes several screenplays and one award-winning short film a cup of tea on the Camo, a sad, sweet, and funny debut, a de debut memoir chronicles his multitasking adventures of filling his mother's last years with love, laughter, and joy. Through not always successful, he came pretty damn close. So let me get Mark in here and let's spill some tea. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Miss Liz. How you doing? <laughs> I am right, good. That was, that was a lot to get through. Right. And while the opening is always like that, it's a lot of words that we need to get out, but a lot of important words I feel that need to get out. Yeah. Uh, you have an incredible bio, by the way. Thank you for sharing that with me, Mark. Well, thank you. Yes. I, I took a lot pains to write it. <laughs> but it's all true. It's all true. Anyway, I'm sharing a cup of tea in honor of my mom and your show and, uh, and my book, a cup of tea on the commode. So it's all, it's all 
working together. I absolutely did. love the title because, you know, I've been doing this for five years and I think I've only had one other guest who actually sells tea on tea time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's always nice to have somebody come on with the tea, right? Yeah. So that was, yeah, it was, that was good. So um, that, that title came out of, um, uh, I, I guess the writing, um, uh, when I was caring for my mom, uh, uh, we had to, uh, she no longer walked after this incident that happened in 2011. So we had to set a, a, a commode bedside and sometimes mother nature took a little longer than was comfortable for either one of us. And so one day kind of as a joke, um, I offered her her favorite beverage, which was a cup of hot tea, skim milk, no sugar. And she said, yes. And, uh, it became a hit. So, um, uh, I called my adventures of caring for her, uh, my multitasking adventures. And, uh, you know, with my mom with a cup of tea and the commode, she was also a multitasker. So uh, that was our morning ritual was a cup of tea and the commode. So that that title just kind of came out and uh, it it's very catchy. And uh, so that's now the brand is, is all built up behind the cup of tea and the commode. I think it's really cool to title on how you got it. And because you. you're bringing awareness as well to taking care of your mother, right? When she became yeah. ill yeah. Uh, and, and celebrating those last golden years. That's what I really liked about the book and, and, and the storytelling. Uh, your thriller really brings it to life. And the Christmas story really touched when I listened to that one. Um, oh, good. Your, yeah, your yeah. Christmas together, the two of you. Um, yeah. r really, really closeness, right? So you guys had a really close relationship. We had, uh, so I, we had, uh, my parents had six children. I'm the fifth, I'm the, the third son. I've got two older brothers, two older sisters and a younger uh, sister. And um, I think I might've been the most curious kid. So uh, I got my parents to open up, both of them, mom and dad, uh, to open up about things that they never, they never shared really emotions or too much of their, uh, their, at least the, let's say the difficult history and stuff. They both grew up during the depression and that was the thing they did. They didn't talk about it, about things too much, but I, 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 I kept asking questions and, uh, eventually got them to open up about some really cool things. And, and I, I became very, uh, close to, to both of them. Uh, and my dad too, which will be, um, uh, my next book will focus more on, on my dad. Uh, but with mom, it was, uh, we had a, you know, when this thing happened, so it, 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 shortly after her 89th birthday, I got a call from my brother. I was living in LA and he said, mom just shut down. Um, and, and she became non-responsive. So he put her to bed and called the doctor and she was living in the house we all grew up in, but we had a, a family living upstairs that was kind of overseeing things, household duties and taking care of laundry and cooking and things. My mom could still uh, walk and, and take care of herself pretty much. But, um, as, as some of her, uh, uh, let's say personal hygiene and stuff like that abilities declined, we had someone come in to help with that. So they got her ready in the morning and got her ready at night. The people living upstairs didn't do any of the hands-on stuff. Um, but my mom, uh, was not happy with, with her life, I guess, at that point. And it was no, uh, a medical reason. She just shut down. And the doctor said, cut off all meds, cut off all food and call hospice uh, and let her go. If she wants to go, let her go. And uh, we got kind of freaked out. At least I did, because uh, 14 years earlier, hospice was called for my dad and he died two days later. So when hospice is called, the end is usually not a happy ending. Yeah. Um, but um, so we all flew in and uh, we were uh, pretty much on death watch. We had a, a Catholic priest come in and deliver the last rites. And uh, uh, my younger sister and I hung out with hospice because we didn't know how long mom was going to be with us. So we wanted to spend as much time as we could with her and also taking care of her to let her know that we loved her and, 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 and we wanted to be involved. So we learned all the tips and tricks from hospice and we became really good students and uh, I think my mom kind of sensed that because she didn't uh, speak at all. Uh, she responded a little bit to touch uh, and she opened her eyes very uh, rarely. But um, I think she sensed that we were there and we brought love back into the house. Apparently there was not much love there uh, for a while. And uh, uh, a number of weeks later, she snapped out of it. 
And I started looking around the environment and stuff and saying, you know, this is not uh, the the warm, wonderful house we grew up in. So uh, some changes had to be made. And so that started the wheels turning. I I, I stayed with um, a hospice and uh, for at least a couple of months and then went back to L.A. and then came back a couple of months later for my nephew's uh, wedding at the Jersey Shore and took care of mom again for a couple of weeks. And that's when I realized that uh, something had to be done on a permanent uh, basis. So I asked my mom uh, if she wanted me to come back. And uh, and she said, yes. And I said, you understand, I'll do everything in my power to keep you healthy and safe. And she nodded and smiled. And I said, that means I'm in charge. And that means you must now obey me. And her mood changed in an instant. And, uh, and then she puckered up for a kiss. I called her a kissing bandit. She loved the kisses. And uh, I wasn't sure if that was a, uh, a sign of surrender or one wishing me luck. And so I gave her a kiss and, uh, and hoped for the best. And uh, it was a, a, a pretty much a, a, a very interesting three and a half year adventure because I was, a, at the time I was a bachelor, I was in my mid fifties, never married, had no children. And, um, so this was my first kid. So my first kid was a, uh, uh, a stubborn, at times grumpy, yet funny uh, 90-year-old woman. So that, so was, that was my parenthood. So Mark, I'm gonna take you back to, uh, I usually start this off at the beginning, but we got into your story right away. Who were you as a little boy? And who are you now through this journey with your mom? You, you know what? I have to say, I'm not that much different from what I found. And it might have been, you know, I had, my brothers were pretty much uh, uh, tortured me a lot. Now I'm the I'm the tallest and, and, and biggest one. And so some revenge may be uh, uh, in, in sometimes in the future. We're not sure. We'll have to see. Uh, but um, I remember my mom told me this. I didn't remember it at the time, but now I, I could see. I have a pretty strong, independent personality. Both of my parents certainly did. They both were full, full had full-time careers. My mother was a proofreader for the largest newspaper in New Jersey at the time, and my dad was a chemist. So uh, my mom worked the graveyard shift. So we, the six of us, were kind of left on our own. Uh, a, a lot. So during the day, it, we had school and things like that. My mom would be there, but that was the time where she had to sleep. So uh, we all became very independent. At one point, we all owned our own businesses. And I wasn't sure if it was because it was our choice or people were afraid to hire us. I don't know. But um, so I was four years old when my mother uh, uh, was expecting my little sister. And I think maybe from the torture from my uh, next oldest brother, I, I told my mom as she was leaving for the hospital, if you do not bring me back a, a baby brother, do not come back. Oh. And uh, and I, yeah, I, I, I could see that coming out of my mouth uh, even today. So uh, it didn't surprise me all that much, but that was kind of ballsy for a, a four-year-old. Anyway, my mother came back like two days later and introduced me to this little girl. And uh, she said, I took one look at her and said, uh, she's OK, we'll keep her. <laughs> so, that, so that's how we started. And so that's that's it's kind of funny. Uh, and then uh, my little sister and I had a really contentious uh, uh, childhood. Uh, and part of it was I think she felt that maybe a bit of that tension. And um, I think because my parents, uh, they had a, a long Catholic marriage, but it wasn't always that rosy. And I think my dad uh, was not happy about the sixth child, uh, maybe. And, and so my mother uh, gave her more attention than the other kids, maybe. And my dad resented that a little bit. And so I kind of filled in that spot, but not until later on. Uh, she was my little uh, test dummy, like I was to my brother's. And um, it wasn't until later on that I realized that she's really a cool kid. And uh, before I left for college, we had a really nice, uh, 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 we got over any of the tension and we became best friends and we're best friends still. So um, that was very cool. But uh, <laughs> the beginning wasn't all that great, I guess. So, Mark, you mentioned something about your mom shutting down at 89. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned that there, the house was not the same as when you grew up. Do you think that that was your mom's way of saying reset, bring back the love in the home? 
I think I have a chapter in the book called A Silent Scream, and I, I think it was a cry for help. Um, uh, she suffered from bouts of depression, I guess, throughout uh, her life. Uh, some of them we didn't know. She had some tragedies early on uh, that may have caused her to erect, I call them, uh, emotional walls. And that was one of the tough things to, to, to crack. And I, I got her to open up a few times throughout uh, uh, my uh, uh, early years because I was really curious, you know, why are you sad and things like that. And she opened up and, and it was lovely. Uh, but I think at this point she was, you know, again, she just turned 89. Said, this is it. This is terrible. I'm out of here. And, um, uh, so yeah, I, I think that, you know, my goal was to not only, uh, add some joy and love, uh, uh to her, uh, last years, cause I didn't know again, how long she was going to be with us, but I also wanted to, uh, uh, make her laugh. One of my goals was to make her laugh at least once a day. And uh, both of my folks had really good senses of humor. And luckily, they passed a lot of that on to their kids. So um, it wasn't a difficult task. And then she made me laugh quite a bit, too. We had some really funny conversations and funny situations. And and um, it's a very, you know, it could be a very stressful job. So humor played a huge role uh, yeah. and throughout my life, uh, too. But especially in, in something like this, a stressful job, humor uh, really helps stress relief. And also you say, listen, this is a terrible situation, but if you look for, and, and one of my mottos is look for the joy, find the joy. Um, if you go in and say, listen, this is maybe not so good, but, um, what's, what's the positive thing I can take out of this. And that helped me through a, a, a lot of this stuff. And, and I think, you know, when you have your 90 year old mom pee on you, it's cute. If you have a, you know, a baby, peeing on a new parent, but your 90 year old mom peeing on you is not a lovely thing. And, and, and I, I said, mom, why are you doing this now? I just got her ready for bed. And, uh, and she said, it's natural. And I just, how can I be <laughs> mad? It, it is natural, but it, you know, maybe not in that, that situation. The role reversal was a little crazy, but um, yeah. So she did, she, she, yeah, she, she was very good at that. So Mark, what does tea mean to you? Well, I, you know, my, it was my mom's favorite beverage. So tea, um, I, I don't drink it that often. I, I do drink it whenever, I, especially when I have an interview. And I think I drank it a lot when I was uh, uh, writing the book. Um, but it's it was a special time for, for me and my mom. And I think one of the loveliest times was just sitting at the kitchen table. Uh, no words were spoken. And mom sitting there with a, a, a cup of tea. And in deep thought or prayer or, or something, but we were just sitting together and nobody had to say anything. It was just a, a, a lovely, a lovely moment. And, um, uh, and I, I wouldn't trade those moments for the world. Yeah. See, that's what my Oma taught me was that, that was a time to recharge, reflect and release, right? It was a time to calm yourself down yeah. and words didn't need to be spoken at that time. Yeah. It just, the connection, the gathering, the community of being together, uh, you know, is what tea represents for a lot mm -hmm. of people. And, mm -hmm. and that's what you're saying here is that it, you know, there was no word spoken, but you guys were still together and you still enjoyed the beverage. Yeah. And you could feel the love and, yeah. and that connection was there. It's fun because one of the reviewers from a, um, uh, I think it was a librarian a critic who read the book and she said, um, reading this book is like sitting down at the kitchen table with Mark, having a cup of coffee. I wish yeah. she said a cup of tea, but either way it works. And, and, and it was very uh, nice because she said the, uh, the, the, the book is very conversational. Uh, and, and certainly intimate and, and if people read it, they'll get it, they get to learn a lot more about me, I guess, um, because I didn't hold back. I wanted to write an honest book. So there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, revelations in there. I think even for my siblings that they didn't know about. So, um, it was important to be, uh, open and honest, uh, uh, about everything. Well, I, I really love the title because the Kamo, right? Nobody thinks of the Kamo as a bonding place, right? Cause it is a bonding place. You know, well, yeah. I mean, normally you're alone, <laughs> but in this this uh, this incident, uh, yeah, this this situation, I guess, yeah, it was uh, definitely uh, didn't leave her alone too long. Uh, and then also, uh, 14 years earlier, with my dad, the um, uh, 
and that commode played a, a, a very special role. Uh, can I tell you a funny story about that? Sure, this, absolutely. Th this, will, this will give you an idea of my dad's humor. So it was just a few days before he passed. Uh, he had heart disease. So that was a, that was a horrible thing to go through. Um, and he died in 1997. So he struggled with that. And um, so we, we bought the commode originally for him. And um, so we set it again, just a few feet from the bed. And at this point with the heart disease, he had about 40 pounds of water weight. Cool. So this guy was normally like 165 pounds and now he's about 200 pounds. And because of his condition, he was pretty much dead weight. So I had to get him over to the, the commode and we sit him down. And my father wanted to hold on to his last uh, piece of dignity, which was he wanted to wipe his own butt. And so nobody ever did that for him. With my mother, it was everything is good. <laughs> Do it all, my kid. You know, I, I love you. You love me. There's, there's nothing, nothing you can't, you can't embarrass me whatsoever. But my dad was very, very firm about that. So he's on the commode. And when he's ready, uh, my mother and, and he had a routine uh, before I even arrived. I spent only the last eight days with him. And so uh, he would get up from the commode and my mother would be there with the, the tissue paper. And so I hold him up because he can't hold uh, his own weight at this point. And, and I'm holding him for dear life. And, and he turns to my mother and says, give me two sheets. And my mom says, two sheets? Why two sheets? He says, I'm very accurate. And I almost dropped him. We all three of us burst out laughing and the poor guy almost tumbled. Uh, but th that was him. He, he had to crack us up until the, to the very end. And so that was that was a, so that commode, actually the same commode. Uh, it was stored in our basement after my dad passed. And, and uh, very few things ever left our house. I called my parents recyclers from the old days. Nothing left the house. So I knew it was still going to be there somewhere buried in the basement 14 years later. And so I found it and cleaned it up. And uh, so it was the same commode. So uh, now that I'm not sure where that commode is now, but it should be in a museum because it had some lovely memories. Absolutely. You know, and, and the reason that I asked about the commode is because we don't talk about that, right? Because that's like a, a hush, like, shh, we're not, we're not talking yeah. about that, right? Because it's private yeah. homes. But with elder care, it's a big moment because you're spending a lot of time and and conversation during that time, right? Because you have to wait right. and and that, um, you know, I, I really want to get into the elder care because you're a, you're a son, and it, like we mentioned before we went live, we talked about daughters and mothers taking care, but not so much the sons and fathers, right? So right. let's talk about that a little bit, Mark. Well, we're catching up. It's still about, a, a, I think a, a, I've understood it to be like a 60-40 split. Uh, but the guys are catching up and I'm, I'm hoping my story will inspire others to do it because, yeah, it's stressful and I said, but boy, I, I, if you could make your, your, your parents last year's uh, just full of joy and, and laughter and love, it, it, is, it, it was such a rewarding experience for me. Um, and uh, I mean, and it was just precious when you, when you see those mo and they know it. And they, if you can, uh, let's say, keep keep the situation as light as possible and, and keep that humor in there and let them know you're doing this out of love, not out of duty, yeah. because they'll sense that as well. And you want to say, listen, this is great, because I told my, I said, if I take this on, we're going to have fun. And we did. Uh, it wasn't all rosy. There were some moments that were, were, were I'm not very proud of, of being a first time parent. And my mother at times could be a tough cookie. And um, so we, we, we did have our moments, but overall, it was just a, a, a lovely, a lovely experience. And um, I wasn't originally intending to write a book. I, I did a lot of recording of family history over the years. Um, I just was very curious about it, but I also uh, like to uh, keep records of things. So I wrote a lot of things down. Sometimes it became a poem or actually a screenplay. I shot a documentary of a trip to Italy. I took my dad on two years before he passed. We visited the little village where his father came from and nobody had been back there in a hundred years. And, and there were some stories about my great grandfather who was the mayor. And so we went back and we actually cleared the family name. And there's a, there's a chapter of that in that book. I'll, I'll expand upon that in the, uh, the book about my dad. 
Um, but that was a very, uh, very cool experience. And my dad said that was one of the highlights of his life. And it was just me and my dad for 16 days traveling in Europe. And it was great. Um, so while I was going through this, I, 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 I had been, I, I said, writing uh, in Hollywood. Um, uh, I was there for 28 years. So I started writing early on. And uh, I did stand up for a while and then wrote screenplays and short films and things like that. So uh, writing was kind of second nature. So I took a lot of notes and photographs and, and videos. Uh, but I had some friends um, being a baby boomer. I had some other friends kind of going through the same situation with their folks. And um, I had a pretty good handle on it. So I shared some of my tips and tricks and they seemed to get some benefit out of it. So I said, you know, I think I got something here that other people could uh, learn something from. If not, I don't call it a how-to book. I said, I call it a what I did book and mm -hmm. people will get some benefits. Some of the uh, the personal notes I've, I've uh, received from people who have read it said that they learned a lot, which was great. Uh, and they laughed a lot. And a, a lot of the, I say, you'll cry out loud and you'll laugh out loud. So there's a lot of really fun stories in that. But I thought, okay, the book is going to be the best way to get this out uh, to more people. And, um, um, and, and I chose then it was going to be a memoir. And so I didn't, I've never written a book before. So I had to study the genre of memoir. So I studied that for quite a while and read a bunch of memoirs and did my research and then, and then started writing it. But I also needed, uh, an emotional distance between the, the, the story and, um, uh, and me writing it because I'm a I'm I'm kind of a sentimental sap. So I you know and even even years later when I was writing it I, I said I'm so glad I'm alone because I'm bawling, and um, so uh, I didn't start writing it. My mom passed in 2014, and so I didn't start writing really till I got to France to really sit down. So it was a couple of years later where I knuckled down and said, okay, this this is we we got to get this thing done. So. So the book was written after your mom passed, right, Mark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, was it was it hard to get it started, or like it wasn't hard getting it started? It was hard to re. I mean, because uh, um, I, I I have a different way of writing, and uh, it, it works great for me. But I, uh, once I'm inspired, I always have notes, and this is all part of let's say doing stand up and being in Hollywood. I have notes or a tape recorder. A, a notepad everywhere. So yeah. in the middle of the night, I get up and, and I can, I learned how to write in the dark pretty well. Uh, sometimes not so well. We have to do some code breaking in the morning, but um, um, so I uh, always was ready to take notes. And there were some lovely conversations and moments uh, between me and mom. And I didn't want the other family members to miss this stuff because I was privy to it. I was there 24 seven. And so this stuff, I wanted them to uh, experience this as well. Um, but uh, so the note taking and, and logging everything in was not hard at all because I, I could detach my emotions from that because this had to be done. I had to get the notes. But to really sit down and get into it. And then once you get started really getting into it, all these memories started coming in because I have a lot of backstory in this. Uh, chronologically, I have that, that story was very clear. Uh, especially from my notes, but I didn't want it to be this boring. Oh, I did this day two, day three, things like that. So I started saying, okay, what, where in my childhood uh, did an incident happen that helped reinforce this particular chapter? Or why did I behave this way? And this was because this relationship with my mom or me and my dad or my brothers or something like that. And then why did my mother act this way? And this could have been something that happened in her past. Um, and boy, those things, I have a, I have a, a pretty good memory. And so boy, these things just started flooding in. Um, uh, so, but to really sit down and do it because a lot of it at that, that time was still pr pretty raw. It was not easy. Um, and, and now let's say I'm writing my dad's and my, and my dad passed now like 27 years ago, there's going to be some moments where I get, I'm going to be teared up and, and hopefully I'll be alone and not embarrass myself too much. And uh, uh, because they're, they're, they're beautiful and important moments in, in our lives. And, and uh, I want to treat them well um, and give them the, the, the respect that they, they deserve. Yeah. 
Well, Mike, you shared something with me before we went live that today is your dad's uh, 109th birthday, if he would still be living. Uh, yeah. So you put a lot of personal touches into all of your work, uh, from what I can see. Yeah. Um, so where did you get that from, from dad or mom? Boy, I, I have to say... Um... Well, I have to say both. Um, it, we grew up in a really loving, nurturing family. My dad's favorite prayer was others. And he always tried to put others uh, in, in, before himself. And we grew up watching that. Uh, he, he didn't lecture all that much. Uh, he demonstrated things uh, by, by showing us. So he would do things and we would emulate him growing up, especially as a man. He would always open the door for a woman. Always stand up when a woman came into the room. Always um, uh, let, uh, especially in church, uh, let the women into the, the pew first and let them out first. Or you had to get out to let them, but certainly go up to communion first and things like that. Just normal, uh, uh, courteous, gentlemanly things. And um, and so I grew up watching that. And, and, and then when you grow up with sisters, you know, they all had, let's say, uh, beautiful long hair. And uh, so I learned how to take care of my mom's hair because at this time, uh, her hair was long and, and straight again. Uh, we grew up with her with short curly perms most of the time. Um, and so uh, I would uh, put her hair in a ponytail or braid it for extra bonus points and things like that. And so um, um, I had I, I maybe a, a little bit of a, a more romantic take on this thing from uh, whether it's my Italian roots or whatever, but I wanted my mom to feel special. So I created a first thing I did because, um, uh, again, at that point, she was 89 and she had all these she wore day dresses all the time, day or night dresses, whatever. But they were old and tattered and they didn't they didn't look great. And my mom didn't have any makeup on and nobody really took care of her hair very uh, well. And so the first thing I did is bought her a new wardrobe. I said, I'm going to cheer her up. Uh, and return some dignity, not only to her, but to her surroundings. So she got a new wardrobe. Um, I created this thing called, uh, I called it Day of Beauty. Um, my mom, I, again, she worked full time and had six kids. She had beautiful long nails. She was a nail model in her uh, late teens, early 20s. She had beautiful, long, natural nails. And um, so she would go to, her, her, her treat was, she would go to the beauty salon uh, once a week uh, for a shampooed set and get her nails done. And that was her treat. And uh, when she came to visit me in LA, I would take her to my friend's uh, beauty parlor in Beverly Hills for the movie star treatment. And I knew she always liked that. Now, I didn't know how long it had been since anybody took care of her that way, or when the last time she may have been at a beauty salon, but it, I, I assumed it was quite a while. So I wanted to re recreate this at home. So I called it Day of Beauty. And while she was on the commode, I, I always gave her a, a sponge bath in the morning and evenings anyway. But um, for Day of Beauty, um, while she was on the commode, I soaked her feet in Epsom salts. I shampooed her hair. Um, uh, she didn't like the rinsing too much, even though I, I covered her in towels. She would always, ooh, she was, it was <laughs> like, um, but was it worth the, the pneumonia? Yes. She smelled great and her hair looked good. So, um, uh, and, and then I did her nails. And then I um, uh, gave her a full body massage with body lotion and things like that. And she got to pick her own wardrobe out. And then when I put her in the, she could no longer walk after this. Um, I put her in the wheelchair and then blow dried her hair and either put it in a ponytail or, or a braid. And, um, and then I gave, uh, I, I gave her a bright red lipstick to match her bright red nails. And um, I didn't think that much of it other than a, a son doing a nice gesture for his mom. Because what I discovered is feeling pretty does not die at 90. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 people want to feel good and look good and all that stuff. So as um, I would, after uh, we got her ready for breakfast, I would wheel her into the kitchen. And on the way in, we would pass a big round mirror in the dining room. And I parked her in front of that mirror. And she just looked at herself. I don't know the last time she looked in a mirror. I don't know the last time she looked in the mirror and liked what she saw. But what she saw that day was gorgeous, and she beamed. And I leaned in, and I just said, who's that pretty girl? And she loved it. And I thought, oh, my gosh, the power of that little gesture uh, was amazing. And so um, even between days of beauty, I would park her in front of that mirror every morning and say, who's that pretty girl? 
So she knew she was loved um, and she liked what she saw. And, and, and the reaction for her was uh, infectious. Uh, everybody saw that this woman was well-treated and she was happy. And, um, and then I said, okay, we, I, I got to keep going with this. And so I, uh, I renovated her house while, she, while we were doing this because uh, like a baby boy, she slept a lot. And so during the sleeping hours, I would start rebuilding her house to make it this beautiful, loving place that we grew up in. So, um, uh, and then when I finished, the first uh, floor I finished was the basement. And then I carried her down there to take a look at it. And she just loved it. Um, when I did the second floor, uh, uh, we had a bathroom that was uh, built really for six kids. So three girls and three boys. So it was split. It was half boys, half girls. So I, I, I tore it all up and made it one big bathroom, put a huge bathtub in there. And I gave my mom her, the first bubble bath in years. Oh, wow. And I said, do you want to christen the new bathroom? And she said, yes, of course. I put her in there and I shot a picture with nice models. The, the bubbles were covering up the yeah. private parts. And, and she's, again, beaming from ear to ear. And, and then she pa passes out. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, here I try to do a good deed and I kill my mom. Um, but at least she smelled good. And so I, I pulled her out because at first I thought she was joking again because she, she would do that every once in a while. She would pull a joke on me. So I pulled her out of the tub um, and put her back to bed and called the nurse up. And the nurse said, yes, well, the, the hot water lowered her blood pressure. So she fainted. And oh. so I stayed with her till she woke up. And then when she woke up, she didn't remember anything about fainting, but she did remember the new bathroom. So it was a win-win for me. And, and it would have been hard to explain that to my siblings. Oh, by yeah. the way, <laughs> I gave mom, mom had her bubble first bath. bubble bath <laughs> and her last bubble bath. I'm leaving. <laughs> Don't look for me. So, Mark, has it brought your siblings closer to you for doing all that for your mom? I don't know. We were all pretty close. My dad would get such a because he had six kids in his family. My mom was an only child. Uh, my dad had six kids in his family and he didn't get along with all of them all that well, I guess. Uh, because he marveled at when we had family reunions, how much we seemed to enjoy each other's company. And he would just get a kick out of it. And, and, and it was, a, I guess, a lovely gift to him. Uh, and and I, I felt it was kind of sad for, his, you know, with his, kid, you know, his brothers and sisters didn't work out that well. Um, but it, it may have, uh, you know, when I wrote the book. I, I only let them read a little bit of one chapter because I needed... Um, some more research information on my uh, on my parents because again I was the fifth kid so the older kids had some more uh, facts I think that that and and they were very helpful uh, but that's all I let them read because I was warned especially from my uh, memoir teacher don't do it because these are your memories they can write their own book everybody's going to have a different perspective on the exact same incident so um, boy is that true um, so I was a little uh, 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 anxious about w what they would think about it. Uh, and they all wrote beautiful notes. Uh, there was one correction from my sister. I got her college major wrong, which I corrected when I did the audio book. Uh, and there was something else my brother uh, objected to uh, that I corrected also in the audio book. So when I, when I have a, I may do like an anniversary version where well, I'll, I'll update and fix these things in the print versions. Um, but I think so, because I've always been really good. Like today, I, I post on all my uh, uh, social media platforms uh, a tribute to my dad for his birthday uh, and for my mom and her birthday and also the, the, the days where they left uh, uh, for heaven. And um, uh, I've always done that. And um, um, I hope they like that. I, I, I think they do. I get some nice notes from some of them. Other ones I haven't, you know, don't hear from or they're not on social media all that much. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I got a, a pretty good relationship with, with, uh, most of them, the, the two middle ones, which is tough for the middle kids, there's something about that. Uh, there's a little more, maybe tension or, or not, not. And, and also now I live in France, three of them have been here. Uh, the two middle ones probably never will come, um, for whether, whether political, religious, whatever reasons it's, 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 it's a sad, but again, if we all got together, they just had a reunion in New York in uh, late July. So the five of them all got together. I said, that's a little too uh, far for me to come for just a couple of days. So uh, I was represented on iPhone.
<laughs> and uh, and they had a lovely time, but they said, you know, two days was about it. You know, they didn't need to spend that much more time because everybody's getting up there and they all uh, uh, have their own things to do and stuff like that. But uh, we did do a Zoom with them and it was it was a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, I mean, for for a time we did uh, when my dad was here, we we did 13 uh, family reunions, I think, in a row. So yeah. every summer from 1990 was the first one. Um, we got together for a week somewhere back east. And we had two actually up in Canada as well. Uh, and it, those were usually lovely, sometimes a little tension flare, but not much. And it was really uh, my, my dad's gift. He, he would pay for the house and everybody would travel uh, to there. And, and we all split the expenses for the food and stuff like that. But it was one week of all of us all together. So at that point, it was like 20 something of us. And it was great, and especially for my folks to um, to see all their kids really enjoying each other's company. And, and it was good for me being an uncle at that point. Uh, there was, uh, I think, just six kids when we first started, six nieces and nephews. And uh, and then that went up to 11. And now the great grandchildren is, is ridiculous. I have one sister who's four years older than me, I think has 17 grandchildren. Oh, wow. <laughs> So she made up for my lack. She's got her whole <laughs> baseball team going. <laughs> oh my gosh! And and they get together. It, it, they she has a house up in upstate New York where they had the the reunion with my siblings, and boy, for Christmas it's got to be uh, thirty people there or something with the wow. with the husbands and wives and all the kids. It's crazy, but wow, she loves crazy. it. So, so I want to talk to you, and, Mark. I did some work and some research on you, and I found something about Grandpa Poe. Who's Grandpa Poe? Grandpa Poe's my dad. And he had some popcorn or something? He, uh, in 1963, he was a pretty clever guy. And in 1963, uh, McDonald's and those kind of things were sprouting up. And uh, he had six children. So I think his motivation was uh, impending dental bills. So he wanted to keep us away from junk food and candy. And so he wanted to come up with an invention that was just as addicting but healthier than that. And I, I still don't know how he did it, but he decided to play with popcorn. He says, popcorn's popular. What can I do to, to, to make it different? And so he invented a way to half pop it. So instead of the fluffy white uh, popcorn, it was a golden crunchy nugget and it was oh. addicting. And we loved it as kids. And uh, he called them Nutri-Nuts. And, um, so we grew up with this stuff, and he had a, a couple of opportunities to work with a big company, but nothing uh, that was too attractive for him. He wanted, um, he didn't really understand, I think, the business end. So he wanted a bigger deal up front and things like that. And so it never happened. And as we started these family reunions, actually, in 1990, um, the nieces and nephews started hearing about these Nutri Nuts. And I said, boy, what, that's a shame. And I guess that's, again, me with my uh, family history. Uh, I said, you know, dad, this is, you know, these guys should taste this stuff. So please give me the recipe. I, I helped him a lot when I was a kid, but I was never successful trying to make it on my own. Um, and it's a dangerous, a messy process. It's not that hard to do, but it's, it, it's a little dangerous. And I actually, once he gave me the recipe, I almost burned down my apartment in Los Angeles. Uh, but the stuff tastes great. And I said, okay, I'm not taking that as a bad omen. And then I started sharing it. Uh, with my friends in Hollywood. At that point, I was studying at the Beverly Hills Playhouse. So we had like 80-something people in my class. They were in my uh, test market. And they, they went nuts over it, just like we did as kids. And I started doing research uh, and found out there was nothing on the market like it. And this is like 40 years later. And, um, and the next family reunion, I brought some. And so the, uh, the, uh, the new members of the family got to taste this stuff for the first time. And um, so the, I asked my dad, I, you know, I told him what I wanted to do with this. This was going to be another, hopefully not one of my nonprofits. But uh, uh, so we started the snack food company um, uh, while I was working on it. And then my dad passed before we actually got into the stores. And then once my dad passed, my brother uh, came in as a financial partner. And, uh, and uh, the next year we were in the stores with this product. And then... Um, uh, we became the snack of the day on the Rachel Ray show. Yeah, I see that got, too. That was and then we got, 
we got natural uh, national distribution after that point and we had a really good run in the beginning and we had a lot uh, a couple of big companies again after us and uh none of that stuff ever panned out and then i ended up building my own factory in la which we just sold actually last summer um uh and it was it was great but it was uh, insane because at that point i was doing all the marketing uh all the production and handling everything in la my brother had stores he was covering in the east coast and i was covering uh, the west coast and we had a, a we had a distri distributors and and salespeople and stuff but none of those were actually doing all that much for us and that was a shame um so it, it got to a point after like 15 years, it was tired. So I wanted my dad's name on it. He didn't want his likeness or anything like Oval Redenbacher on it. He asked me to promise that. So um, I changed it to uh, from Nutrinuts to Grandpa Poe's Originals. That's what all the kids called them, the grandkids. And um, um, so that was it. That was Grandpa Poe's Originals. And and I still have people. I have a, still have the Facebook page. And people keep asking me where they can find it. And, and it's been almost 10 years it's been off the market. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I seen that. I was like, that's pretty interesting. I got to talk about that popcorn. <laughs> yeah. There's some uh, fun stuff. Um, I have a, a bonus material uh, section on the a Cup of Tea on the Commode website. Uh, and you'll see pictures of the, the packaging. I don't know if you'll see uh, much else, but there's also the Grandpa Pose Originals on Facebook. So you can see Rachel Ray holding the bag and things like that. So, uh, yeah, it was it was fun. I think it, it was fun to see my dad uh, smile. And whenever I got a job in Hollywood, I would bring the snacks with me. Uh, sometimes they, they might have helped me get a job. Uh, and then I had people, uh, have them featuring on TV shows and product placement and stuff like that. So it was, it was, uh, it was, we had some really fun moments. Well, that's really cool. Yeah. When yeah. I seen that, I was like, oh, I got to get, I, I seen the picture with Rachel Ray and I was like, well, that's really cool. I used to watch Rachel Ray all the time. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I want to get into your tea because you gave me theater, empathy, and avail availability. I want to talk about those three words. Why those three words? What was the first one? T? Uh, theater. Theater. Well, you know what? I have to be honest. So uh, all my experience really uh, 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 was called upon on uh, for this role as, as the caregiver. Um, uh, my design uh, work helped in studying and in my experience in that because in, in design, um, you Empathy is a big word for design, but also for caregiving. But empathy, you, you need to consider the end user, whether it's a brochure or, or, or a machine or a Xerox copier or a suitcase, anything you're designing, you have to understand how that person will be using the product, how they relate to color, how they would hold the thing and, 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 and what images they would look at, let's say, first in a brochure or a book or something like that. So empathy was something that was kind of ingrained uh, from my um, my education and stuff as a designer. Um, I would say theater because um, I had to assume this role. It was not a role that I had any experience with, really. Um, and uh, being your your mother, um, I had to get over seeing a ninety year old mother naked for the first time, and. Um, so, uh, I, I would say my acting training came in where I said, okay, I'm the caregiver now. I'm not the son. I'm still the yeah. son. I have to treat her as my mother and, and, and treat her with respect and ask for permission and things like that. But I'm also the caregiver. So I got to get over this stuff and get on with it. Cause I have a job to do. Yeah. Um, and what was the last one? Availability. Well, again, uh, be available. Open up your heart. Uh, my uh, Again, my goal was to make my mom's life uh, easier and, and more joyful and stuff like that. But I had to open my heart and say, listen, I'm doing this. I'm going to make the best of it, not only for mom, but for me and for my siblings. Uh, I wanted them to, to certainly trust me. Uh, and they did. And my mom trusted me. But I had to be open to everything because there were going to be ups and downs and there's some curveballs thrown and things like that. So um, I guess that's what, what I meant by available. Not only my my heart, but as a, being physically uh, available because you, you're going to be there most of the time. I did have uh, every few months to go back to L.A. To, to cook the Grandpa Poe's originals. And I had a sister. My sister lived in uh, California, so she would fly in and and, uh, 
and take over for me for that one week. I called it Hell Week in, in, in Los Angeles. And then I think my, my sister didn't have that much fun taking care of my mom. So she called it Hell Week also. So Mark, what got you to the Celt of France? An airplane. An airplane, but <laughs> are, like, is it you a know, new journey in life? Is there a new book coming well, out? Like, do you have? I have. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. If I get after I finish my dad's book, I may write some books about because people seem to love, you know, like my year in Provence and all that kind of stuff of Peter Mayer. So uh, people like to live vicariously through others, and I. I I like adventure. I get bored easily um, with my mom. I, I couldn't, you know, whether I got bored or not, I, I had to pretend I wasn't. So that's where the acting comes in. But um, uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine put the bug in my ear. She said she always wanted to retire in, in France. And so I came here for the first time and, and I've been to Italy I, on that trip with my dad. I felt very comfortable in Italy. And I do a lot of this with the hands. Uh, but I felt, I think, even more comfortable in France. And I didn't speak the language. I, I you know, a few words. You know, we have 40,000 words in common, oh. France, French and English. Didn't and it. it's amazing. If you start thinking about it, anything with an I-O-N, but, you know, hors d'oeuvres. I grew up on a cul-de-sac. It's French. Um, anyway, so um, uh, I was very comfortable. And we have French on my mom's side. Uh, we may be like third or fourth generation uh, uh, French. My mother was French and Irish, and my dad's Italian and German. We're second. I'm a second generation Italian, so I, I felt more closer to my Italian roots. But I think my French ancestors must have played a role in this somehow because um, I came to France the first time, really liked it. Came another year um, to actually start looking at, at possibility of places, and then in 2015. Uh, this, uh, I don't want to say old girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, uh, we were no, no longer a couple, but friends. And we thought, well, maybe if she finds something, maybe we'll uh, buy it as an investment and she could come when she wants. I come when I want. And then we rent it out the rest of the time. So she found this little village where I live. Um, and we stayed the, the house that she found that she really liked was outside the village. Uh, but we did an Airbnb in this little village. It's called Pezinas, and it's about 20 minutes from the sea, and it's in the middle of the largest wine-growing region in the world. And uh, my house, this apartment that I found, was built in 1540. The history here, it's cobblestones, and it's just 15th, 16th, 17th century uh, a place with a lot, a lot of really cool history. And um, so I found this place and said this would be my home. And then uh, a year and a half later, I was here. Wow. Uh, and there's no reason why it should have worked out because it, it took 17 months to figure out how to get a mortgage with the, the French financial system. Uh, that was not so easy. Uh, and uh, the gentleman that I bought this uh, uh, apartment from was not a nice man. And I'm sure he would want to sell it to anybody who came in sooner. But he waited because the um, uh, the they have what they call a notaire here, which is your lawyer, your real estate lawyer. And the notaire, I met him for like 10 minutes, but for some reason he really liked me. And uh, the part of that is attitude. I was like, oh my gosh, I love this. I love this town. I love this blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I want to buy this house. And uh, he told this guy, who was not a nice guy, we trust this man. We like this man. We want him to have this house. Do not sell it to anybody else. And he didn't. Oh, wow. And, and the history, uh, like 1590 like, and 1540, like that's yeah. a long time. Yeah. And I've had a couple of spiritual guys come in here. No bad vibes. So no oh, major, you know, no dark, dark stories here. But they so there's a, a, a beautiful uh, they have these things called hotels, which are not actual hotels, but they're aristocrats homes where they would invite their uh, uh, fellow aristocrats. And so Hotel Lacoste is right across. And uh, usually you have these buildings. And then in the center is a courtyard. So in the Hotel Lacoste, I'm still part of that whole perimeter. And then and there's the courtyard in the middle. So they said uh, there's a, pre, uh, a bread oven here. And uh, so I asked uh, people at the museum, I said, so why, why do we have a bread oven here if the hotel's there and that's where the kitchen and everything? He said, well, the soldiers stayed in your place and oh. they needed to cook. So the horses stayed on the first floor. I'm on what they call premier etage, which is actually the second floor, but one floor up from the ground. 
And uh, so the soldier stayed here. And uh, uh, the, the guy that, that was a, not such a nice gentleman, whoever came in and did some renovations, because it's all historical, I can't really do anything structurally, uh, did an okay job because they, he, he, he bought it, I think, in the early 70s. And it was a money pit. This town was really run down for a while because I have friends that live right across the way that they've owned their house for about 25 years. And they said, oh, this place was a mess. Not even uh, 10 years ago was was it. Now it's a, a lovely place. The whole village is very cool. They've really done a nice job. But um, uh, my street, it, it, apparently, the like the year before I bought it, wasn't cobblestone. They put cobblestone in, which makes such a difference. I probably still would have bought it because the inside of the house is, is quite nice. Um, yeah. But it's very cool. They said Moliere was born here. The actual writer was not born here. He was he came down from Paris, but he wasn't Moliere yet. Um, wow. And he wrote a couple of his big plays here, um, spent just a few years. But you'd think he built the place because it tributes to Moliere everywhere. It, it's amazing. But they have their own Hollywood Walk of Fame with all famous French actors who come. They come and, and visit here. And, and, and uh, there's a new movie coming out, uh, another version of uh, The Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, that was filmed here. Um, um, and uh, I think Jean Paul Bamundo and Claudia Cardinal did a movie. Um, Cartouffe. No, not Cartouffe. Oh, I forgot what it was. Anyways, 1963 that, that, that took place here. And, and you see the movie, you'll see some of the landmarks that are still here. It's very cool. So, and they're very creative. There's a lot of artists, a lot of writers, a lot of musicians. Um, uh, there's painters, there's ceramicists, there's sculptors. It, it's it's really a cool place. And they do a lot of uh, wonderful theatrical productions all throughout the year. Uh, so that's the really cool thing about Moliere, because they'll set up a, a, a stage in the middle of the historic center. I'm about 50 meters from the historic center. I'm oh, in the wow. historic center, but they have this place, Place Gambetta, which well, that's where they have a lot of the big concerts and the big shows, and they'll put up a stage there and they'll do Moliere plays. And they have their own theaters and stuff too that were pretty famous, but uh, it's nice to see it, you know, just a few feet from your door. And of course, the, they have wine domains everywhere and the wine is is actually, for the most part, cheaper than water, at least bottled water. Because wow. it, it's it's amazing and it's great. It's, it's, it's lovely French wine. So if you're into wow. wine, come visit. <laughs> Well, you know, I have a reason now because I know somebody that lives in the South of France. I know I've got her. a great guest room. So you're, you're, you're absolutely welcome. Bring tea. No, they have a great tea store too. It's a, they have tea with popcorn in it. Oh, wow, they have these that. like open bins of tea. And I wanted to get something unique for my sister. She's a big tea drinker. And I saw once with popcorn. I saw for my dad, it was perfect. It's, and I said, I thought it was a weird combination, but she actually said it was pretty good. Well, look at that. Your dad and mom are right there with you in Celta, France. Well, well, yeah, they're, they're haunting me all the time. I think they, they had to be getting a kick out of this whole thing. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure they're they're smiling. So, Mark, you, where, where would you like to see your book go? Would you like to see it be made into a movie? You know, I've had some people, uh, of course I would. In, in fact, uh, the way I wrote it, because of my experience with screenplay, um, I have an opening scene and a closing scene, which are perfect for uh, opening and closing of a film. Um, I have some Hollywood friends that have mentioned, I have some people who aren't even Hollywood people who have written some of the, the reviews have been lovely. Uh, the sales are going pretty well. I like them to go more. I'm pretty aggressive with the marketing, but my, my publisher is, is very happy uh, with it. And um, it's won eight awards so far. We got another one last week. Uh, and I think more will come because it's up for a bunch of other things. And um, uh, and, and it, it's just lovely. So we'll see. Um, uh, a friend of mine is a, a, a retired casting director uh, from Hollywood. And he says, oh, my gosh, this has got to be a movie. So he's throwing out names and everything. But, I'm, you know, it's Hollywood. I'm not that excited about it anymore. So yeah. I'd rather write. Uh, so I'll keep writing. I may write the screenplay. I don't really want to write the screenplay yet because that's a lot of work. And, you know, I want to wait until I have a, either director or star attached. So see we're, we're on the same page as far as what to do with it. 
Um, but I don't think that would take me that long uh, to get it done. But I want to focus on the next book about my dad. But I would like this to get out to more people. It's a, it's a good story. Uh, it's a funny story. There's a lot of funny uh, stories in there and funny dialogue and, 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 and things. And um, um, uh, I'm, uh, I would like it to inspire more people uh, to get into this stuff. So it's qualified to be a bestseller on Amazon in several categories. So that's kind of nice. And now with the awards, it, it's very nice. Uh, and so we'll see, we'll, we'll keep marketing it. You know, you're, you're waiting for the Oprah to jump in or, or the Reese Witherspoon or the Jenna Hager, Bush Hager. Um, and those are hints and, uh, and <laughs> hint, hint guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, never, you, you never know, but the, I mean, there's a lot of, so I, I did a, one of those little videos. I said, celebrities who love your mother, you will love this book. Yeah. Calling all, all celebrities. I mean, there's a ton of them that have very special relationships. Taylor Swift loves her mother. Uh, Reese Witherspoon. I mean, there's many of them. Bradley Cooper and all this stuff. So, uh, again, you, you never know. And you, you, you got to find that that one champion who's going to, uh, 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 I guess, really get it out there. So, uh, in, in the meantime, I will keep pushing it. And, uh, um, yeah, and when I do, uh, you know, shows like yours and stuff like that, it, it's, it's lovely to... Uh, uh, I, I say that it's it's uh, telling these stories, especially about my mom, uh, keeps her in the present. So that's a lovely gift to me. And so I, I, I love that opportunity and I'm very thankful. So, Mark, if anybody wanted to reach out to you, how could they reach out to you? I'm really busy now, so just leave me alone. Okay? <laughs> Drinking tea. I'm trying to hide out in France. I've got people at the grocery store still want my autograph. Of course, it's to pay for groceries because I have a, a U.S. card. But um, if they Google a cup of tea on the commode, uh, the website is a cup of tea on the commode dot org. Uh, cup of tea on the commode for the the, the Facebook, Pentagram or, or Pinterest. <laughs> Pentagram. I put them together. Oh my God. I just merged the $2 billion companies, uh, Instagram, Pinterest, even TikTok. But you, the YouTube channel, if you go there, you'll see a lot of fun videos. There's probably, uh, there's gotta be over 150 of these things that I'd be doing little one minute teasers, uh, which are a lot of fun. And then if you want to read, the, read the reviews on Amazon. I mean, the Amazon reviews are lovely. Um, and it's an, it's in uh, paperback, uh, large print paperback, ebook, and also the audio book is kind of fun because I added some theatrical uh, elements to that, which makes it a little more enjoyable. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for joining me on Tea Time and sharing your story with your mom and your dad and your family and all that. And sell to friends, right? If anybody wants to check out that little tea shop with the popcorn as well, you check it out. You Very know. cool. Yeah, it's called Pezenas. Pezenas is the village. So come, come visit. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for having this time with me and with my listeners out there. Thank you to the listeners and supporters out there. Thank you for everybody that uh, tuned in today and listened in and uh, always look forward to your comments and feedback as well for these tea times. I will be back tomorrow with a special spe uh, tea time with a returning guest, uh, Lillian Brumpton will be in and we'll be talking about intentional networking. Uh, so that should be an interesting conversation. So join us for that. That'll be at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then on Thursday, we have two tea times coming in. We have my Sacred Heart Rising sister from the anthology, Sacred Hearts Rising, who will be coming in. And she'll be talking about her book called You Do You. And then in the evening, we have an animated illustrator that's coming in and talking about illustration and children's books and all that. So we have some really good conversations coming to the table for Tea Time with Miss Liz. So if you want to know more about Miss Liz, check out Miss Liz's website at www.misslizesteatime.com or check out the YouTube channel, ring that little doorbell and check out all these incredible tea times. There's over 300 tea times that you can listen to. Uh, from all walks of life, all different countries, all different styles, um, and all different flavors, because that's what Miss Liz does, is I share stories and words with tea. And we'll see you tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a second tea time of this week.